want to now introduce our two speakers for today. First, our co-host, Paul Petrulis. He's from Inframark. He's going to go over a little bit about himself and his company in just a moment. And also, we have Kirsten Hensa from our Tampa location for K. Bender Rembaum. But first, let's kick it over to Paul to let everybody know a little bit about himself and what Inframark does. Paul, sir, it's all yours. Yeah, well, well thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Kirsten, for having me. Uh, and welcome, everybody, uh, to the webinar. Um, Inframark Community Management, we represent about 200 associations throughout the state of Florida. We are a southeastern regional company. We're based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, but we're based, we locally here are based in Wesley Chapel near in the Tampa market. Uh, but again, 200 associations, uh, both condos, HOAs, co-ops. Uh, so we understand what you're going through and the questions that you're going to have and the confusing part of tenants and guests. And you're not alone when it comes to being confused. Uh, I like to use the example of, and please don't be offended by this, you board members, uh, I like to use the phrase that board members tend to be ignorant. Now, I don't mean ignorant in the stupid sense of the word. I mean ignorant in the sense that you just don't know what you don't know. We're doing this on a daily basis. It's our livelihoods. Uh, Kirsten is a, an incredible wealth of knowledge, as is Jeff, about how to make your life easier in an association. Nice one, Jeff. I like that. Uh, <laughs> but objectively speaking, the law is challenging and it is constantly changing. Now, full disclosure, I'm not an attorney. I don't play one on TV. Anything I say shouldn't be construed as legal advice. So please do consult your individual association attorney, because as Jeff, Jeff mentioned, we're going to be talking about these issues from the 5,000 foot view. Your, the minutia of your individual association, we really can't touch on because, again, that just leads us down a path that we almost can't get out of in that respect. So that's Inframark. And, and again, I'm Paul Petrulis from the Inframark family. Been doing this for about 15 years. There's nothing you've seen that we haven't run across uh, and again, the law can be challenging and it's constantly changing, but happy to be a part of this and answer some questions and engage Kirsten as she's talking, because she's going to give you the legal mumbo jumbo, so to speak. <laughs> and then I might jump in from time to time going, you just heard the legal side. This is how it might relate to you on the operational side of your association. So welcome, everybody. Glad you're with us. And by that, I'm going to shut up and be over, give it back to Jeff. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And before I introduce our, our instructor for today, one quick question in the Q&A. Does this count for board member continuing education? We don't have the word yet. This is something the division rolled out without having all of the answers just yet. So what I would do, hang on to the certificate that you can that you can print later on, save it, print it, just in case when the division later on, maybe they'll say that anything you've taken after July 1st will count. You'll have this in your back pockets. We don't know. So as of right now, no, this does not count. Save the certificate just in case they say later on that it is retroactive. We just don't have an answer to that yet. So Kirsten, I want to introduce now Kirsten Hensa. She is the managing attorney over at our Tampa office location. I call her affectionately the walking encyclopedia because she never is clueless for an answer. She is wonderful. You're in good hands today. Kirsten, please a little bit about yourselves and then take us uh, right into the class. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff uh, and Paul. Uh, again, I'm Kirsten Hensa, and I am one of the attorneys with the law firm of K. Bender Rembaum. For those of you who are not familiar with the firm, um, our main office is located in uh, South Florida, but uh, we do have other locations throughout the state, uh, including Palm Beach Gardens, Orlando, and then uh, I manage the West Coast office for the firm, which is located in Tampa. We have uh, 22 attorneys throughout the state, and we have uh, many clients throughout the state. So not just in Tampa, Sarasota, Venice, uh, et cetera. So we are a, a full service uh, community association law firm. That is our specialty, our bread and butter. We don't practice any other uh, type of law. So uh, if you need association representation, uh, you we know a, a, a law firm that can assist. All right, so we're going to start with, um, let me see. Let me <clears throat> put the slides up, of course, technical difficulties. I'm ready if you have any te technical. Technology is great when it works. I mean, it's, 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 it's an amazing invention when, when it works. All right, do you see it? Not yet. We totally need the Jeopardy theme happening. We need mm. 
<laughs> yeah, are we allowed to hum it without getting sued? Do you see the slide? Not yet, but I'll um, do not. Do you want to put it up? You got it. There you go. Okay. I'm ready. Can you see mine? And I can see yours. There you go. All right. So what we're going to be discussing today is the process to approve, disapprove uh, owners, new owners, tenants, and then certainly we'll talk about guests and additional occupants. Okay. <clears throat> now, what can we even restrict? So when we're talking about uh, controlling the behavior of others, right? that we have to have uh, authority to, to do that, right? So the ability to approve or disapprove uh, purchasers, tenants, and guests, uh, it's not an issue that is uh, governed or even addressed in the Florida statute in 718 or 720. It is an issue that would be very specific to your community and it would be set forth in your governing documents, okay? So the first thing you'll want to do is go and pull your governing documents to see what, if any, authority you have as to purchasers, uh, owners, uh, 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 tenants, and then guests. So what are your governing documents? Well, you have at least three, right? And it would be either your declaration of condominium, if you're in a condominium, or a declaration of covenants, if you're in an HOA. And then you will have your articles of incorporation and bylaws. Now, hierarchy in terms of which document controls, the, your declaration is gonna be your supreme document, right? It is the contract between the association and the owners that buy into your community, right? So it is the document that is going to uh, address your use restrictions and really a lot of your authority as a board. What can you do uh, or not do with regard to uh, purchasers, tenants, and guests, okay? Now, the next uh, document in, in the line of hierarchy would be your articles of incorporation and then your bylaws. And your articles and your bylaws, they really don't address your use restrictions. They address really the, the, the corporate structure of the association. As you might be aware, the association is a not-for-profit corporation that is governed under Chapter 617 of the Florida statute. And therefore, it has to have articles and bylaws. So these documents will... Uh, indicate, for example, who qualifies as a member in your community, who qualifies as a director, uh, how you have to run your elections, uh, what you do in the event of resignation. And it might also set forth uh, additional powers uh, and duties for the board. <clears throat> However, as, as to the authority to approve or disapprove uh, purchasers, tenants, and uh, guests, that has to be really in your declaration of condominium or covenants, okay? Now, you might also have rules and regulations. A quick note about that. They do not, uh, they, they, they're not part of your governing documents, okay? They are just what they are. They're rules and regulations, and they can uh, supplement or they can clarify uh, restrictions that you might already have in your declaration. What your rules and regulations and policies should not do is um, provide restrictions or policies that really have no authority, that you have no authority to adopt. So uh, Paul may have mentioned already, you know, what we often come across is that, you know, communities don't have the authority to approve or disapprove, uh, you know, certain individuals in your declaration. And then the board decides to adopt a policy giving the board that authority. That's not really going to fly if there's a legal challenge on a disapproval, right? Uh, and the reason is because in Florida, there's a three prong test that you have to uh, that you have to really follow in order for a rule to be enforceable, right? So the first thing is that with a rule, you have to have the authority to even adopt a rule, and that authority will typically be found in your articles or in your bylaws. Assuming you have the authority to adopt rules, the next prong is that the rule or a policy cannot conflict with your declaration. 
So if, for example, your declaration is silent on your authority to approve or disapprove purchasers or tenants or guests, and then you go ahead and you adopt that as a policy, then clearly there's a conflict because under the law, if your documents are silent on a matter, the implication is that that matter is not restricted, right? So if you don't have authority and then you adopt authority by rule, it conflicts with your declaration. And that's where you're going to have issues in enforcement down the road when you disapprove uh, an individual, okay? <clears throat> and the last prong is that the rule has to be reasonable. So your rules and your policies have to be reasonable. And ultimately, that is uh, a judgment call that a judge is really going to have to make. Now, let's say you do have uh, authority, right, <clears throat> as to these um, uh, individuals. Now, what are you really looking for? You're looking to confirm that you have the ability to approve certain types of individuals uh, residing in your community and that you have the right of first refusal, especially when it comes to sales and transfers. Now, I will talk about the right of first refusal uh, uh, in a few slides because that is a, a typically a, a complicated, um, a complicated uh, issue, but again, you're looking to have express authority to approve or disapprove. And typically your disapproval would have to be for good cause. I'm sure you've already heard that term from time to time. Your disapproval has to be based on good cause criteria. And if you don't uh, disapprove based on good cause criteria, then that's where the right of first refusal comes in. Another thing that you might uh, wanna look in your governing documents is confirm do you have the ability to charge for background check? Uh, also known as really your application fee. Now under uh, chapter 718 of the Florida statute, the authority for the association to charge an application fee has to be set forth in the governing document. Again, that's not a rule or a policy that you can adopt. As, as it relates to the application fee, the statute actually specifically says your authority to uh, charge that fee has to be in your governing document. Now with condominiums, the statute also sets a current rate and it's currently set at $150 per applicant. Now spouses, and then certainly a uh, parent dependent child, they are considered one applicant. Okay, so you can only charge one fee for that. <clears throat> Now, the statute has, uh, or it was changed uh, a couple of years ago to increase that fee. It was uh, initially at $100, and it was increased at $150. And it's quite possible that the statute might change in the future. So as a practical matter, if you have the authority to charge a fee in your declaration, and you have a fee set in your declaration, or if you don't have the authority to charge a fee, my suggestion is speak with your legal counsel about amending that out, amending your declaration to just give you the authority to charge an application fee in the highest amount provided by law as amended from time to time. That way, if the statute changes in the future and the fee is increased and will only increase, then you don't have to amend your documents every time to include a new fee amount, right? The, the your governing documents will just adjust uh, will adjust the uh, application fee up to the maximum amount provided under the law. So Kirsten, uh, yeah. forgive me for interrupting you there, but I can I can envision board members on this call pulling up their governing documents right now, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, the question I have for you, because I can see this coming, is if the governing documents are silent on the ability to charge these types of fees, that $150 that the law clearly allows, but the governing documents are silent on it. If the association has been collecting those fees, quite frankly, then what? Do they have to refund those dollars because their governing documents were silent on that matter? I don't know that they have to you know, reimburse the owners, but just know that if you do request that application fee for which you have no authority to request and the applicant right, or the owner of the unit that's trying to rent or sell challenges it, then I think, you know, at that point, you 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 stop and you don't collect the fee. Um, 
you know, because otherwise, you know, you're 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 obviously doing something that's that's not supported by your your governing document. And um, just just know that that it is subject to legal challenge. So you want to try to amend as quickly as you can. Now, security deposits, right? If you are a community that allows uh, leasing, right? You could, if you wanted to, request that either the owner or the tenant place a security deposit with the association for the sole purpose of the association having uh, uh, you being able to use these funds to address any damage to the common areas or common elements caused by the tenant, right? If the tenant runs into the gate, right? Or, you know, breaks a common, you know, some, some, some portion of a common element, right? You could use the, that security deposit to address the damage. But again, with condominium associations, the statute specifically says that your authority to charge that security deposit has to be set forth in your governing documents. And the most that you can charge is up to one month's rent. Okay, so check your documents, see if you have or not this authority. And if you want it, you'll need to add it by amendment. Now with HOAs, the statute doesn't really address security deposits. But again, if this is something that you want to start charging in the future for best enforcement and to avoid a successful legal challenge, you should amend your declaration to give you that authority. Now, down payment requirements. You might want to uh, or you, you 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 might be a board that requires that uh, you know for purchasers uh, certain uh, percentage uh, or purchasers have to put down certain amount or you can't finance more than a certain percentage uh, of um, the cost of the unit. So if you want to include a finance requirement, again, that's something that should be in your declaration. Move in, move out deposits. That's another thing <clears throat> that is very different from the security deposit that you're holding for the tenant for the duration of the um, of the lease. The move in, move out deposit is just to cover damage, you know, to the elevators, to the walls. If the tenant, you know, scrapes the walls with the furniture, so if at the end of the move in, right, or after, at the end of the uh, move out, uh, there's no damage, it would need to be uh, deposit. Uh, return the deposit would need to be returned so it is a refundable deposit but again you might want to speak with your legal counsel about whether or not you want to have this and what if any uh, amendments you might need to do to your uh, governing document another point and I didn't add it here but for HOAs not condominiums you might want to consider whether you want to require new buyers to per to provide a uh, capital contribution and typically the capital contribution will be um, up to, you know, one month's uh, assessment. Some, uh, depending how the amendment's even drafted, you can have a specific amount. You could indicate you want the capital contribution to be, you know, six months worth of assessments, but it really is intended to, um, to, to provide additional funds uh, for the association to address, um, you know, maintenance, repairs, replacement, that type of thing. All right, next slide, Jeff. So now we talked about the authority, right? The authority to approve or disapprove certain types of individuals has to be in your governing documents. Assuming you have that authority, what transfers are subject to approval? Well, you have your typical arm length sale transaction, right? This is the uh, purchase uh, sale agreement for a unit or a home in your community for which there is consideration, right? That's your typical sale. There are other types of uh, transfers or conveyances. For example, there could be gifts, devices, or inher inheritance transfers. So, a gift transfer would be, um, let's say an owner uh, bought the unit uh, as a single individual and then got married down the road and now wanted to add the wife onto the unit or the wife wanted to, to uh, add the spouse to the unit. Or you have a parent that wants to add a child to the deed uh, for estate planning purposes, right? These are called life estate deeds or you want to transfer title in your unit to a trust, a revocable trust, again, for estate 
uh, planning purposes. Or what, what if this, uh, you're an owner that just inherited this unit from, um, you know, from, from a deceased parent or a relative, right? The question to you is, do you want to be able to have the authority to approve or disapprove these transfers? <clears throat> you might want to even look at your governing documents to see what it currently even says about these transfers. I have seen documents where these types of transfers are specifically exempted. So if a family member inherits a unit, um, then that family member can continue residing in the unit and doesn't have to go through the background check to get uh, board approval, okay? So there could be exemptions or you might wanna add exemptions. If you're amending your documents to give you the authority to approve and disapprove sales and, and leases, you might want to be the board that wants to exempt these types of conveyances. That is a board decision. Just note that ultimately, when you amend your governing documents, the membership will need to approve them, right? But how you want to prepare this amendment, what kind of authority you want to give yourself, you know, that's a board decision. And obviously speak with your legal counsels about how to how to properly draft those amendments. What about transfers by operation of law? Well, I mean, if you are a community that allows uh, business entities to own, like limited liability companies, if that entity dissolves or if that entity merges in with another entity and now there's a new entity owning title to the unit, right? Do you want that transfer that transaction to also be subject to board approval. What about foreclosures? Typically, if a unit is foreclosed by a lender or even at the association, the purchaser at the foreclosure sale is exempt from uh, board approval. And that is because practically speaking, it's you can't screen uh, uh, an applicant at the time of the foreclosure sale, right? Right? Foreclosure sales now take place online. So there's really no mechanism in effect for that third party purchaser to buy a unit at foreclosure and then have to go through the approval process. Right. So typically mortgagees and third party purchasers at foreclosures are exempt from the approval process. However, that said, I have seen governing documents that say if that mortgagee later wants to sell, or lease the unit, or if that third party purchaser wants to later sell or lease the unit, that transaction is exempt from board approval. So it's up to you as a board, if you have that type of provision in your document, you might wanna speak with your legal counsel about not exempting those conveyances or those transfers after the foreclosure sale, right? Because why would it need to be exempt? What about leases? <clears throat> okay, you might have some of the older documents that say, you know, uh, an owner can enter into a lease without board approval. Do you want to have the ability to approve or disapprove tenants? What about additional occupants and family members? Additional occupants, um, you know, typically if, uh, if an owner is selling the unit or is leasing, the applicant would have to identify on the application, you know, every individual that's going to be residing with him on her while they're occupying the unit. But what about these additional occupants that move in after that initial approval was already rendered, right? Like in the example of the owner that uh, purchased the unit uh, single and then, um, decided to have his spouse, right? Or girlfriend, boyfriend move in. Uh, not necessarily added to the deed. They're just occupying the unit with them. You know, that's an additional occupant. What kind of provisions or what kind of authority you want to have as to screening these individuals? And then, you know, family members. Do you want to exempt family members or do you want to treat family members that move into the unit after the initial approval? Do you want to treat them similarly like, you know, everyone else? It doesn't matter whether you're a family member or not. If you're going to occupy the unit within a certain time frame, then yes, you have to go through the approval process like everybody else. Some communities, I can tell you, some of our clients prefer to exempt family members. For example, if you, um, 
if you have adult children <clears throat> that are off to college, right? Or adult children that at some point later on decide to move back into the unit, right? They weren't initially screened because they weren't part of the initial application process. But do you want to have to screen those individuals? Again, these are all business decisions. Now, what about guests? Again, are you know, are you um are you a community that wants to allow guests to occupy indefinitely? Or do you want to restrict occupancy for a certain period? Does it matter whether you uh whether the guest occupies the unit with the owner or tenant present or in their absence? So these are just some of the questions that um I'm raising for you to think about as you're reviewing the document, right? And as you're figuring out how, how you want to operate the condominium or your community, right? And, and, and what, if anything, needs to be amended in your documents to address your concerns. All right, next slide. Kirsten, before you, before you jump into that, yeah. uh, a simple question that comes up from time to time with our clients, and I'm certain with others uh, on, the, mm -hmm. on, the, on this webinar, is the amount of fees, going back to the fee issue, you know, when you're looking to collect uh, an application fee of the, the state mandate or the state maximum of $150. But if your docs only allow specifically, they, they, they alert that you, that your fee should only be $50 or no more, no more than 50, but you're collecting the maximum. What kind of concerns do you see uh, if an association is doing that? Again, the, the governing documents allow for a $50 fee to be charged but, and it's not about who, it's not about blame, but the association is now charging and collecting the state maximum of $150. What kind of challenges do you see there? Well, again, it, you know, first of all, if your governing documents already have a set limit and it's not to par with what the statute authorizes, then you're, you're stuck collecting really the amount set forth in your documents, right? Um, so, this is why I was mentioning if, if you are amending, amend out that you know specific amount and give yourself a little bit of flexibility by just giving you the authority to charge the fee up to the maximum allowed by law, right? So it adjusts every time the statute changes. Um, <clears throat> I'm not suggesting you go back and you know start reimbursing everybody, you know, right. the <clears throat> the excess fee. But just know that if you're charging that amount and the applicant or the owner figures out that you're charging in excess, there's where the challenge comes in. Now, whether the, um, I don't want to complicate the issue, but, <clears throat> you know, very unlikely that the owner would sue on, on this particular fee issue, right? But what 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 could come is that the owner could claim that the associates that the association is intervening with the sale purchase agreement, right? And 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 that's where the the potential issue might arise. All right, what can we do? So assuming you have the authority and it's all set forth nice and cleanly in your governing document, right? You start really with the application process. So before you even decide whether to approve or disapprove, right? You start with the application process. And actually Paul might have a little bit more insight on, on, on the application process because management companies typically would assist with providing the actual application that you need the applicant to fill out, right? Do you have a like a, a form that you use, Paul? We do. Uh, in fact, we do have a, a template form that I'll make available uh, through the email function. Uh, and the, the key for that is a level of consistency, right? If the association does not have one and you have the ability to get one, absolutely get one. Don't rely on someone to make one up because <laughs> uh, there are certain specific things that you need to ask in those applications. But yes, we offer that to our clients uh, as a template for them to review uh, and then formally approve for us to use on their behalf. Right. So a typical application will require the applicant to provide their name, identify uh, typically all other occupants that would be residing in the in, uh, on the property, as well as provide um, uh, some some references. 
And then typically an application will also include a uh, criminal and a background check form that they would need to sign in order for the association or management to run the background check. And you won't be able to do it without the applicant signing that form. And then very important with the application is that there, there are timelines within which you have to render a decision, okay? And that timeline should be in your governing documents. So generally, I've seen that a board has to approve or disapprove an application within 30 days after you've received the completed application, the fee, and then any additional information that you might need to render a decision. But I have also seen governing documents that have provided only for 10 days, right? So it really just depends on your documents. Now, the important thing is, if you miss that deadline, your documents might say that if you don't render an approval or disapproval within that time frame, the application is deemed approved. So you don't want to be in that situation, right? So check your timeline. So let's say the application um, uh, was completed, you've reviewed it, now what? Okay, well, really you have two choices, right? You either approve the transaction or you disapprove the transaction. And you will approve the transaction if everything on the application uh, indicates that the applicant is um, um, uh, qualifies under your governing documents, right? So what it means to qualify well, this is where the good cause criteria come in, right? We mentioned that earlier. Your good cause criteria are going to be the factors that you are going to consider whether or not to approve or disapprove, whether this individual qualifies to live in your community. So I've identified here some of the more common good cause criteria. For example, it could be uh, negative criminal history, uh, negative financial history, if the applicant on the face has indicated an intent to violate your governing documents. And that could be, for example, if you are a no pet community and the individual has clearly indicated that he or she has two pets, right? That's an intent to violate. So that could be a basis for you to disapprove that application. Uh, there could be false or misleading in, uh, information included on the application. That is a basis to disapprove. Now, I wanna go back to criminal history because criminal history is a tricky one. And I'm sure, Paul, you've uh, you've had experiences with that. But I just wanna note that with, with criminal history, a misdemeanor is not enough to disapprove. I know some, you know, I, I, we, we, we have boards that, you know, they get the criminal background and there's like 10 misdemeanors within the last five years a misdemeanor would still not be sufficient basis to disapprove. There has to be a felony and there has to be a conviction or at least a guilty plea, okay? If all you see are arrests or charges, okay? Those are not a uh, good cause basis for disapproving. So with criminal history, you wanna consider the nature, the, um, the severity of the offense, how long, the offense occurred, and then any rehabilitation efforts, right? With financial history, yes, if you have documentary authority to approve or disapprove uh, sales and leases, then you have the authority to adopt a minimum uh, credit score requirement, right? And typically, when we amend governing documents, we don't specifically identify the credit score requirement in the declaration. Right? I would never recommend that you uh, add an amendment to your declaration to say, you know, purchasers have to have a minimum credit score of 650 uh, to qualify uh, for residency in this community. Because if market conditions change and the board later wants to increase or decrease that, uh, um, that credit score, then you're stuck having to actually amend the declaration and get membership approval. So the better approach is uh, to amend the documents to give you the authority to adopt a, a, a credit score requirement and then have the board adopt the credit score requirement as a rule or a policy. That way you can change um, the, the, uh, the, the minimum credit score with depending on market conditions. But I also want to point out 
let's not get too fixated on this minimum credit score, especially when we're talking about you know tenants and then additional occupants, right? Because remember, at the end of the day, the owner is still responsible for the unit, right? And any monetary obligations owed to the association. So if the tenant, uh, if the tenant's application checks out, and the only thing that you you're on the fence about is their their credit score might not be the best, um, you know, might not be not might not be um. Uh, a good thing to disapprove that particular application. So you really need to look at the totality of the application, <clears throat> especially when you're um, considering financials. Kristen, uh, real quickly, regarding the financial requirement and the application process, and I've seen this in other associations, when an application is submitted and the background check and the, the financial history, which is effectively the credit report by itself, is received, there are times where communities want additional information, but the governing documents might be silent on anything other than a credit report. Is there a, is there a mechanism or a process that you feel that you might deem from the legal side that's appropriate to request other financial documents, whether it's a, a financial disclosure for the homeowner or I'm sorry, the tenant or the, the resident or even banks or uh, uh, tax documents? Um, especially with old, and I've seen this with older documents, uh, while they might not have the best language, I've actually seen where, uh, the documents say that the association has, um, um, gives them basically the authority to prove additional information. So it'll say the applicant has to provide, uh, the application and such other information as may be required by the board. But I, I think if you have the ultimate authority authority to approve or disapprove in your declaration, I think that gives you sufficient basis to then request any additional documentation or information that you might need in order to make um, a decision, right? Because how else would you would you make a decision? So rather than disapproving initially, request that additional information. So we've talked about approving and then we've talked about disapproving for good cause. Right. So if if you find that based on the totality of the application, this individual just does not qualify to reside in the community, then you would issue a disapproval letter. And again, you would issue that disapproval letter within the time frame set forth in your declaration. Now, you want to be careful of how you word that disapproval, because one thing I'll mention in the next slide is that any information that the association obtains uh, through the sale lease approval process must remain confidential. So you don't want to start putting on that uh, disapproval letter. We disapproved the applicant because and start, you know, identifying the basis with a lot of specificity. The best approach is to send a, a disapproval letter that simply says, you know, the applicant, we're, the board is disapproving uh, because the applicant failed to qualify under the governing document. Okay, and then we'll talk about uh, the notification requirements in the, in the next slide. Now, let's say you disapprove for reasons other than good cause. And as I mentioned, for example, criminal is, is a common one where sometimes boards see a lot of arrests, a lot of charges, but they're not convictions, but still decide, you know what, we just don't want this individual residing in our community. <clears throat> so you've issued a disapproval letter. One thing to note is that the applicant does not have standing to challenge the disapproval. It is the owner. So let's say in this example, the owner hires an attorney and sends you a letter and says, hey, you're dis you've disapproved the applicant for reasons other than good cause. All this individual has is arrests and charges. There's no conviction. This is not a good uh, cause basis for disapproval. That attorney might then demand that you exercise a right of first refusal. And that means that you then have to provide an alternate purchaser to purchase the unit under the same terms and conditions as the initial uh, contract, okay? And the reason is because in Florida, okay, if the association wants to have the ability to approve or disapprove sales or transfers of title, 
okay? It has to have a corresponding right to then exercise a right of first refusal and then provide an alternate purchaser if they disapprove for reasons other than good cause. So, and I know it's a lot, but your governing document should be drafted in a way that the right of first refusal language is already incorporated in your declaration. And if you don't have right of first refusal language in, in, in your declaration, then that whole sale transfer uh, approval provision is essentially uh, void and invalid because it's it violates Florida law. Okay, and that's law that's not going to be in the statute. You're not going to find it in the statute. That's law that's derived from case law. Okay, so you want to make sure if you're adding authority to your governing documents to approve or disapprove sales and transfers that your attorney properly drafts that amendment to comply with Florida law. Now, right of first refusal only applies to sales and transfers. It does not apply to leases and other types of occupancy. So what I have seen over the years is some of the older documents might uh, provide a right of first refusal um, authority as to leases. And if you have that type of document, then you're gonna have to exercise right of first refusal as to leases. So if you don't wanna do that, then the best thing to do is amend that out of your declaration. All right, next slide. All right, so just quickly, potential liability, right? So first thing is you can never disapprove a sale or a lease or occupancy uh, based on uh, a protected class, right? So under fair housing laws, protected classes include race, national origin, familial status, sexual orientation, mar marital status, and there's others. So that that could never be the basis of your disapproval or you will be uh, looking at a fair housing discrimination claim, right? Also, disability based in accommodation or modification. So let's say this uh, owner is applying to uh, reside in your community, right? And you're no pet building. Well, the applicant uh, indicated on the application that the applicant has an emotional support animal. Okay, disapproving that applicant based on that uh, representation of emotional support animal on the application will get you in trouble, right? Because an individual with disability is entitled to request an accommodation. So if they're seeking to have an emotional support animal also live with them in, in the community, then the best approach is that you follow fair housing guidelines Okay, to get whatever information you need to make a decision as to whether that individual qualifies to have an emotional support animal. In the example, for example, where the owner is uh, or the applicant is clearly in a wheelchair, right, and uh, or is blind, right, and needs uh, an emotional support animal or needs a service animal, where that disability is very visible, right? You don't have the authority to request any additional information. That's it. You have to grant. And and by the way, we have other uh, webinars that we teach specifically on, on fair housing, um, uh, fair housing laws and, and requests for accommodation. But if, for example, you have someone who the disability is not readily apparent, but they're saying they need an emotional support animal, that's a situation where you might be able to request additional information in order to make a decision. And the same thing with modifications. Modifications are uh, if an applicant, for example, would like to make a modification to the common element, right? Because he has a, or she has a disability. So if the individual is um, in a wheelchair and needs to add a ramp, they're buying a unit, but they need to add a ramp in order to be able to get in and out of the unit. That is a modification. Right, you can't deny an application based on their request. So just be aware of that. All right, and then notification requirements in the declaration. I, I mentioned this already. Again, you wanna make sure that you comply with the deadlines that are set forth in the declaration or 
that application will be deemed approved. You want to make sure that you properly notify um, the owner of the disapproval, right? You don't want necessarily to put, you know, all the specific basis for disapproval because as I mentioned here, under Fair Credit Reporting Act and Florida statute, both 720 and 718, any information that you obtain in connection with the sale, lease, or transfer application must remain confidential. So the background check, the application itself, if they've provided tax returns or uh, pay stubs, uh, copies of driver's license or security numbers, all of that has to remain confidential. And guess what? Neither the owner nor the applicant is entitled to receive a copy of the background uh, report, whether it's the criminal or the um, uh, or the credit report. So if you're going to disapprove, you have to include in your disapproval letter, okay, the name and the contact information of the reporting company, the reporting entity that ran the background check. And you have to give that information to uh, the, the owner and the applicant so that the applicant can then contact that uh, entity and then dispute any information on the report directly with them. All right, next slide. <clears throat> All right, and then guest occupants and additional occupants, right? These are individuals that uh, come and occupy the property after the initial uh, approval has been rendered, right? So again, I you 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 know things for you to think about. You know, how do you define a guest? How long does this individual have to uh, live in your community before they uh, are considered a resident or an occupant? How long do they have to reside in your community before they are required to um, to, to get a, a board approval for continued occupancy. So you might wanna draft your amendment to say that after a certain period of occupancy, they're deemed a tenant, right? And then they have to go through the application process like a tenant and get approval. Mentioned immediate family members. Do you want to add them to the same requirement or do you want to get them exempt? Maybe guest occupants have to reside in your community for no more than 60 days or 30 days before they're required to get board approval, but immediate families can live for up to 90 days without having to get board approval, All right? That's up to you. Occupancy limitations. How many uh, permitted occupants where not owners are allowed to reside in your community? Is that even addressed in your documents? Maybe you want to address that. What is the duration of permitted occupancies? Like I just mentioned, what about registration requirements? Do they have to register with the association in advance if they're not, um, if they are not required to get uh, prior board approval? What about um, over non-overnight guests and use of facilities? All right, just things for you to think about. Next slide, Jeff. All right, some practical considerations, and then we're going to wrap this up. So if you're a community that either doesn't have uh, governing documents addressing any of this, or you want to start making some changes, maybe you want to send out a survey to the residents, see how they feel. You know, are they going to be receptive to um, having their guests or family members uh, get uh, board approval if they're going to occupy the unit beyond a certain period. So you might want to survey your community. Lease renewals. Do you want lease renewals to be subject to a new application or and background check? Some boards want that, some boards don't, but that would need to be specifically addressed in your documents. We've talked about screening additional occupants. What about use of facilities? and common elements, who gets to use them? Um, and then access control. Do you have the ability to control access to these facilities? Is there a FOB system? Um, or is, is, is there a system where the uh, occupants and um, guests have to register to be able to use your facilities? Or what if you want to um, you know, deactivate or suspend their, their rights? <clears throat> Vehicle registration. Do you have a process in place where 
uh, new owners and certainly tenants and guests have to register their vehicle in order to park in the community. Well, maybe you want to get with management to, to discuss your options. We talked about key parts, up pop system, uh, gate access, and again, front door procedures. If you're, for example, in a, in a, in a condominium, uh, you should have procedures in place uh, for those uh, additional occupants and guests to register in advance. Next slide, Judd. All right, and then enforcement. You know, typically with, um, with condominiums and HOAs, before you can even file a lawsuit against an owner to enforce any of this, right? Let's say um, an owner added uh, a, an occupant to the deed, right? There was a quick claim deed done and that individual didn't get board approval or the owner decided to lease the unit and the tenant didn't get um, board approval, even though you have the authority to, to, to require the approval, they didn't get it. Now what? Well, Typically, before you can file a lawsuit, you have to go through mediation process. Arbitration is for condominiums, uh, but condominiums also have the ability to mediate disputes and certainly HOA. So you would have to mediate the dispute with a mediator before you can even file a lawsuit. But what if you wanna get, get rid of that occupant, right? Or that tenant? The tenant's not approved and you wouldn't have wanted to approve the tenant because you just know this is a problematic tenant because he's, you know, lived in the community in the past. So what if this occupant is, you know, a problem occupant, a nuisance occupant? Okay. Well, there is an exception under both statutes where if you're, you're seeking to get the, the occupant or the tenant removed, you can bypass the mediation process and get, and go straight to litigation. Okay. But an even faster process is the process of eviction. Unfortunately, most governing documents don't automatically give the association the authority to evict a tenant, right? With eviction, the association would stand in the shoes of the owner, would stand in the shoes of the owner and then um, force the eviction, right? You have to give yourself authority in your governing documents uh, to allow the association to evict. It is a much quicker process for sure, but it's one that you have to have authority in your governing documents. Please, may I, may I jump in on the eviction yeah. process from the management side? Sorry for interrupting you there. Uh, Kirsten is mentioning that it's a fast process. That can mean a bunch of different things. Yes, it is faster than arbitration and litigation, but please do not be under the assumption that you can evict somebody in a couple of weeks, right? It's it's it doesn't work that fast, so to speak. Yes, you do need Not to take the steps fast. from the legal perspective to do it. And if you are considering that, the earlier you get the association attorney involved in this process, the easier it will be. But I would implore all of you board members listening that if you're considering the eviction process for any tenant or even an owner to a certain extent, sorry for saying that, but if that's the case get the process started with documentation early because if you don't have any documentation then you effectively have no bullets in the gun to uphold that eviction uh, so that's a lot of potentially violations failure to pay fees damage from the tenant could be a bunch of different things but document 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 while you're engaging the association council regarding the eviction process will make it exponentially easier to do it yes you can do it just document and be consistent Sorry about right. that. And and while we're on the topic of attorney's fees, make sure that your governing documents provide uh, an, a prevailing party attorney fee provision. Not all documents do. And if you do end up in arbitration or if you do end up in litigation and you are the prevailing party, the party that wins, you want to be able to get recovery of your fees against the violating owner, right? So make sure you have language that that gives you that ability, that protection. All right, last slide, and then we'll go to the Q&A. So in conclusion, what did we learn today? We talked about confirming and creating authority, right, with regards to sales, leases, and occupancy. We talked about establishing procedures and proper documentation. You must act uniformly and consistently, right? And Paul mentioned that. That is so important. 
What about adopting resolutions and delegating authority to your screening committee or a board member? That is an option, right? And then again, understand the purpose and the extent of your documentary authority before you do anything. And that's it. That's all we got for today. Well, thank you very much. Now, fantastic as always. Great input, Paul, uh, stepping in every once in a while as well. Thank you for that. While Paul and Kirsten are going through a few of the questions, there are many. We're not going to get to all of them. We'll get to a few of them. I want to briefly go over one more time because while we want you to stay, you're not required to stay for the Q and A. You have you completed uh, what you need to what you need to stay for. So, in the chat area, we placed the link for the evaluation. I want you to go ahead and click on that if you haven't already. And just to quickly go over that while Kirsten is going over some of the questions here, you fill this sucker out. It's not as daunting as it looks. It goes relatively quickly. You hit that submit button, and after you hit that submit button. Your confirmation screen, and this will answer a lot of your questions from the Q&A, uh, this is where you get the link for your certificate. You click on that link and your certificate will pop open right there. Yes, we know it's blank. You print it out, write your name and CAM license in and save it for a rainy day if you need it. Uh, in addition, we have a link here to download the course material. Many of you were asking about the slides. This is where you get them. So fill out that evaluation, and then on this screen, it says click here for the slides. Another tab will open up. Then you can either print them or save them. The icons to do that might be different in a different place depending on the browser that you are using. I'm using Google Chrome. And then we also have a link for the legislative guide written by the Rembaum of Jeff of uh, K. Bender Rembaum by Jeff Rembaum. That's right there. Kirsten's contact information, Paul's contact information, and what else we have coming up is right there. I'll go over that a third time after the Q&A. Back to you both. All right. Christian, there's a, there's a ch uh, question that came up in the Q&A chat that um, I don't know, so I'm, I'm throwing this out to you. This is about a 55 and older community that a 49-year-old individual submitted the application but it's, since it's a 55 older community, I know there's a percentage that, that have to be over 55. For that 49-year-old individual who is sending the application in, can the association just deny it straight up even though, or can they override the law, uh, the 55 and older threshold uh, to accept that, uh, that application? Well, first, obviously they're, 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 they have to make sure that they are 55 and older community. Sometimes communities think that and that not, that's not necessarily the case. So definitely get with legal counsel to make sure that you have met all the requirements to qualify as a housing for older persons. The other point is, I'm not sure in this scenario whether the 49-year-old is applying to purchase the unit or just to occupy uh, the property, right? Because they're two, two different things. The 49-year-old can own the property in a 55 and older community. It's just the occupancy, if that individual wants to occupy the property, they have to do it with someone who is at least 55 and older. So the age restriction is not to the, as to the ownership of the unit, rather the occupancy, right? And you're right, there, there is a, a 20, 80 percentage, but that 20% that, that is really supposed to be for situations where, for example, you have um, you know, a couple, one of the spouses is a younger spouse, and they've lived in that uh, on the property for years and the older spouse dies, right? As long as the occupancy of that underage adult occupant doesn't exceed the 80-20 threshold, that's where you can grant the exemption. And that person clarified it's a purchase for a, for the for the 49-year-old themselves. Um, well, they can purchase it. They just need to clarify with the purchaser that they need to occupy the unit with someone that's at least 55 and older. Yeah. Another question that I was actually going to ask if I saw it pop up in the in the chat was it's about the discussion of a board of the board with this application information that's submitted, background checks, financials, any of that stuff, you know, those modification requests. When the board discusses that, is that is it okay to do it in a closed session or does that discussion, because you're potentially dealing with private information? Does that does that discussion have to happen in an open session or can that be in a closed session? 
Well, as long as the board is not making any decisions at the time of discussion, I mean, certainly less than a quorum of the board can meet to discuss that application and the specifics without having to notice the meeting. I would say if a quorum of the board is going to get together to discuss the application, um, as long as they're not making any decisions, rather just kind of, you know, a workshop meeting, right? Or just reviewing, discussing the, 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 the negatives, the pluses, whatnot. But as long as they're not making a decision and actively uh, voting on whether to approve or not the application at that particular meeting, then it, um, it wouldn't constitute a meeting under the law. So, so to use that in the, the normal sense of, of board members getting involved in board meetings and properly no, noticed meetings, if it's on the agenda to discuss Unit 5's lease application, the board can kind of recess, go into an executive session or a closed session to discuss the particulars, whether that's physically leaving the room or asking everybody, anybody in attendance to leave the room so that the board can discuss those particulars. But to your point, you can't make a decision in that room you have to then open the room back up, allow people to come back in, and then you could say we're approving or denying. Um, but as I understand it, to discuss those those individual pieces, it can be done, but it needs to be done in the closed session part of it, as long as you're not making a decision. Right, right. And when you do reconvene, I mean, don't just rubber stamp the decision. You can, you can have a little bit of a discussion, you know, um, just I wouldn't necessarily go into all the specifics. You know, this individual has, you know, five misdemeanors, you know, right. drunk DUI, just, you know, he has a negative criminal history uh, that and and doesn't qual qualify based on our good cause criteria. Leave it at that. There is one question that literally just popped up a couple of minutes ago that I, I had a feeling was coming. Uh, and this was <laughs> can the decision be made by the CAM instead of the board? Now I'm going to answer this one from the management side of it, and I would love your opinion on it from your side, uh, from the legal side. So the question of can a decision be made by the CAM instead of the board? It's going to be answered with a question. Why would you want management to make that decision? It's your association. It is you. You live there. We don't. Giving management the authority to approve or deny a lease, although may be efficient from your side, in our mind, from the Inframark side, gives way too much authority and ill-advised authority to the management company. So I would say to anybody asking that, and I'm not going to use the name, but anybody asking that, don't. Don't let the managing agent do it. It's not the, it's, it, there's no reason to do it. That's why you're on the board or that committee. That decision is yours, not management. How do you feel about that, Kirsten? Yeah, I agree 100%. I, I mean, I think, yes, management can certainly uh, review and run the background um, application and, you know, can make their um, recommendations. Suggestion. Right, suggestions. Suggestion. Right. Like, these are your criteria based on what I've reviewed. This individual has XYZ in the criminal history. This is their uh, financial kind of laid out for the board. But you're right. Ultimately, the board has to make that business decision. Uh, we do have uh, one question that popped up. Can the this is about security deposits? Can the security deposit be used to pay the maintenance fees if the owner stops paying the maintenance fees? No, absolutely not. For seven eighteen, the statute specifically says what it can be applied for, and it's really just to cover any damage to the common elements or association property. Now, um. If there's an issue with the owner um, potential you know, with, with the with the with the credit report, and you um, you have a fee or you you have a a basis to believe that um, you know perhaps their their financials might affect their ability to pay association assessments. There are ways that you can request the owner to pay, let's say, six months worth of assessments up front. Right? There's a mechanism. You know, might require an amendment and a policy, but it's an option in that particular situation. So piggybacking on that question of letting management make that decision, another one popped up of, well, what about just letting the board president do it? So here comes management's perspective, legal perspective. 
should the board president be allowed to make those decisions, approve or deny you deny these lease applications or these pur purchase applications effectively unilaterally? From a management's perspective, the answer isn't no. It's hell no, excuse me for saying that, but it's <laughs> hell no for the, for the same reason. The authority rests with the board itself, not with an individual. And this is where, respectfully to all those board members out there, this is where rogue board members tend to get in trouble going off that beaten path. From a management's perspective, it is really hard to work with because that board member might have just told the homeowner, yep, it's approved, with nothing behind it to support the authority given to the president itself. It's the board that makes those decisions. So if you have a board member who's making those unilateral decisions, I would implore you, have the association attorney contact that board member and tell them to stop it. It can only get you potential problems down the road. Doesn't mean it's going to happen today, but down the road, those rogue board member decisions only cause problems. They don't solve anything. Would you agree or disagree with that, Kirsten? Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> the hell no part. Sorry, just had, I had to do that. And, and the reason I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about that type of an answer, Kirsten and, and, and everybody on the, on the, on the, th the feed, is because we see this on a day-to-day -day basis. We've all seen the internet and we've seen news reports of this board member did this or this, they did that or whatever it might be. And then you've got management going, if they just would do it as a group, they can still deny and they can still accept. But because we're trying to be nice people, we're gonna get that information out, that answer quick. Oh yeah, Mrs. Smith, go ahead, do it. It's only gonna cause problems. So please don't do that if you, if you can avoid it. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to go off on a little tangent there. Let's do, uh, do you have time for one more? Sure. Do one more question, then I'll go, then you guys, I know you have meetings and uh, appointments to get to, and I'll go over, I'll stay on to go over the techie stuff on the evaluation, how to print everything. I see a few folks are still unclear about it. So do another question or so, and then I'll remain on to, um, you'll give your parting words, and then I'll remain on to go over the technical stuff. Sure. Um, I mean, just I'm just looking for one that kind of is a, a general question here. There was one that was kind of kind of comical in a way because it made me chuckle anyway. Is there is there an actual definition of immediate family? It's like who's not pissing you off this month, you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you you would have to define immediate family in the declaration, and it's typically the um, it historically been defined as you know the spouse the parents the siblings and grandparents to some extent um the, the, the big the big joke kirsten is that's going to be determined after next tuesday who's invited to thanksgiving yeah, and who's not and that's right you have to be in the declaration so you <laughs> can't just uh you know change it because you know whatever right it would require yeah. membership approval to modify it in the future right. so. didn't mean to interrupt paul i just found that one kind of serious and funny at the same time sure sure and 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 it, it totally makes sense right because there are there will always be the homeowner or the 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 tenant who is going to play a game right they're going to try right. and leave out certain information on an application right and the best practice is if the application is incomplete even if a single digit is missing on a phone number just deny it they didn't fill it out in the first place properly so you as an association have to ask either either it was a simple mistake, no problem, or what are they hiding, right? I mean, it, 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 I hate to say it, we all want to think everybody's on the up and up, but we just don't live in that world. People will try and play a game to get in. Now, from a legal perspective, this brings up a different issue. And if I go too long, I apologize, Kirsten, but I'm going to ask you this directly. Happy Valley HOA or Happy Valley Condominium Association realizes that there is a new tenant in Unit 5. And they realize it because the U-Haul truck showed up. No documentation, no nothing was submitted, no fees. What steps can they take to either stop the move-in or engage the homeowner about the violation? All right. So you never recommend that you stop the move-in. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do call that. the no. police and I will tell you the police will not assist. Don't stop in the doorway, preventing them from getting in. Okay. Document the move in. 
follow up with your legal counsel or first your management to send them a letter saying, hey, John Smith, it has come to our attention that you have a new tenant move in who hasn't been screened by the association. As you know, Article 5 says, blah, 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 please submit your application in the next 10 days and pay this fee and you go from there. And then escalate it to your attorney uh, if, if the owner and tenant do not respond. And ultimately, this is where the removal of the tenant and the eviction comes in. All right. All right. Well, thank you both. And before I go over the nerdy techie stuff and assisting folks with the evaluation, Paul, um, how can everybody reach you? The best way to reach you and uh, some parting words. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for everybody for taking the time. And I commend all of you board members for continuing to engage in your associations. doesn't matter if you're self-managed, professionally managed. The more information you have, the better decisions you will make. As I mentioned at the very beginning, the law is confusing. We're not attorneys. Please do not expect your manager to be, to be a full-blown attorney to interpret the law. Quite frankly, that's what Kirsten and her team are for. It's the same thing in insurance. Don't expect us to know insurance because you need licenses to do those types of things. So just understand those types of scenarios. Uh, but I'm happy to engage anybody. It doesn't matter if you use Inframark or not. I'm happy to help get you more information, answer any questions you might have. My direct phone number, ironically enough, is 727-240-5371. That's my cell. You can reach me whenever you want. I'm happy to engage by phone or by text. And by email, you can reach out to me at paul.patrulis, and that's P-A-U-L dot P-E-T-R-U-L-I-S at inframark, spelled I-N-F-R-A-M-A-R-K dot com. Happy to, happy to engage you at any time, answer any questions that you have. These are a lot, there's a lot of heavy lifting in some of these, this yeah. law stuff. Uh, so happy to try and uh, help you through it. Particularly this year, particularly with everything that just came about. Thank you, Paul. And thanks for having us and inviting us today. Kirsten, same for you. Uh, uh, what's the best way uh, for folks to reach you? And uh, some parting words on this fine Halloween yeah. Thursday. Thank you so much, Paul. This was this was a blast. It Gotta was, it yes, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's so important uh, for boards to be educated and at least know the questions to ask. We right. don't expect you to know the law. As Paul mentioned, this is why you hire professionals management, legal counsel, accountant, insurance agent, right? To assist you. But the purpose of these webinars are really for you to know the questions you need to ask, right? To get better educated. So thank you for attending. Um, you can reach the main office of the firm, which is 954-928-0680. Uh, please go on our website, kbrlegal.com. Uh, for additional information about upcoming webinars. Uh, and my email is khenze, H-E-N-Z-E -E, at kbrlegal.com. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope to do this again sometime. And you're both welcome to hang out, but I know you have things to get to. I'm going to remain on for a few minutes. I'll open up the chat. You could ask me technical questions. Paul, Kirsten, thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks again, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye.